we all basically call Budapest home, but not everyone on the stage is, is Hungarian. So can, you, can, you, can we just go down and tell me what living in Budapest means to you? Um, personally, professionally, what does it mean to you? Claudia. I'm Italian originally, and uh, I grew up in Rome, so quite a big city and, uh, and everything. And I moved to Debrecen first. Mm -hmm. So it was like a very small place and everything worked. Uh, the tram was on time and this was shocking for me. And uh, I really liked it. And then I thought to step it up a little bit and yeah. move to Budapest. And I also really liked to stay here. I felt that, again, everything was working much better than, uh, than it was in Rome. I felt it like it's a very safe city. Mm -hmm. uh, also, as a woman, to walk around during the night, uh, I think it was really, really nice. The weather was not my favorite thing, because uh, so, um, originally I was born in Sicily. Ah, right. So, and this is where I live right now. Sort of a different climate. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So, so you moved back to Sicily? I moved back to Sicily uh, last year. Nice. So. Balaj, what does living in Budapest mean to you? What, what does Budapest represent to you? Budapest represents to me my, my favorite city. So I was born here. I was born in the 8th district. It's, a, it's in downtown area. And then I moved to the 3rd district, to mm -hmm. Roma area, which is more a recreational area. It's a very beautiful area near to the Danube. So I really love this city. It's extremely diverse, isn't it? You have really industrial zones, but you also have really big open spaces, and they're not more than 45 minutes away from each other. We can say that Budapest is a huge city, yeah. so, yeah. It's fantastic. Dr. Toldi Shorol. Actually, I, I'm born in Budapest, uh, and I'm on the Buddha side, uh, near the forest, so it's the first 18 years I probably one or two times went out to the other side, the Pest <laughs> side. Uh, actually, uh, the medical university was in Pest. So Budapest means for me hometown, first fall in love. So that's it. I really like it. I studied in, in uh, the States, in Germany, but I always came back. Keeps me coming back as well. Like I, I lived here for the first, well, until I was 18. Um, for eight years, and then I, I went away to study at university. And I was like, I, I, I don't, I don't like living in the UK. I want to go, I want to go back to the source where all the, where all the really fun firsts happen. You know, this is where, this is where I, this is where I grew up. It, uh, it really represents something special to me. And you know, I'm now in my 30s, and the, the end is not in sight. Um, Claudia, sort of switching gears a little bit. Could you tell me a little bit about what the, what the war in Ukraine is doing to the energy situation? especially in Hungary? Well, a lot. <laughs> I mean, of course, right now, I mean, everybody's like super worried about the security of supply and uh, it's not so much about the price, I think, but if we're going to have like gas at all or if we're going to have heating at all and next year when we have the electricity year starting, then we will all worried about do we have el enough electricity uh, about that. So I think that here, I see a lot of people worried here uh, even like individuals, not just the companies or politicians, like compared to where I come from or to other towns where I've been recently, I've been to Amsterdam, for example, or in, uh, to Paris. And there people are not really worried about what the war is doing in, in, uh, in the energy industry right now. They are more worried about next year. So I always mm -hmm. see this, this little bit of difference. It's, it's causing a lot of uncertainty, right? And, and I mean, cities are sort of based on predictability yeah. Routine. I mean, it's just the latest crisis. So we're just we don't see like a crisis on top of crisis. Right. So I mean, like I, I've been in this industry for the past like eight years, and uh, there was a time before COVID when everybody was just uh, worrying about technologies, and it was a lot about startups mm -hmm. and digitalization in the energy industry. And then we had COVID, and everybody was worried about climate change and biodiversity loss and biodiversity protection. And then the war came, and it was still during COVID and everything. So now, also the like the worries and the fears are kind of shifting uh, a little bit. Yeah. In, in in which direction are they shifting, and how how permanent do you feel those those concerns are going to be? Well, I think there is no going back to normal. I think this is now the new normal. Mm. Uh, I remember in uh, in 2020, just after COVID, I was talking to some some people in the energy industry, and they were thinking, so how long will it take for us? to go back to pre-pandemic levels. And now they're not even thinking about that because there is no going back. So it's like we have to adapt and live in the world that it is right now. Yeah. And we have to tackle also different crises because uh, as a journalist, sometimes we follow trends and we forget about something else. 
So it's like now everybody's writing about gas and then, oh yes, but there is also climate change protection and we also have to remember about that. And there is also the sustainable transportation topic because I mean, very soon we will have to ditch our diesel cars. So we also have to think about that. And uh, everything that we do right now is just to get ready for when that moment will come. Mm. When the moment will, the world will be ready and we can say we are ready as well. Yeah, so we're talking about sustainability and how we can adapt. Balaj, what does that make you think of in your role as a, as a, as a sustainability expert? Um, what, is it, what does it mean to have sustainable living in a city? Is that an oxymoron? There is no proper answer for that. Everybody should have found his or her own way. So it depends. It depends on a, where are we living. We living in a flat or a house or many many things. We live far away from from where we are working or or close. Every move what we make costs something, like like carbon footprint right. or we can we can count in every measuring way but every move what we make it costs something what does that so mean on a, on a more macro level though you're talking about the individual i'm talking about maybe structurally the way a city is set up how can how can it sort of ensure its its longevity yeah that's the hardest thing because our cities uh, were built thousand years ago yeah. like so so the structure of the cities are not like a, a modern structure we have to found out something we can use in these old structures so 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 yeah most cities are very fragmented first I can say the traffic which cause really big uh, pollution Absolutely. in the cities and not especially just carbon dioxide the other toxic things uh, which are coming out from from the cars, mostly in downtown areas, inside in the cities, the pollution is very very huge. So I would say that if we can, if we if we could uh, change it for e-cars maybe or e-transportation, mm -hmm. electronic transportation, downtown areas, the cities, that 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 could be a big advantage. The the yeah. smoke and the, 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 the harm what it caused. Yeah, I mean, speaking of which, Emil, you're, you're a cardiologist, is that correct? Yes, I'm an invasive cardiologist, you know, that people who are uh, first giving a needle and then say hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, as, as a cardiologist, what is the impact of living in, in a city versus a more rural or suburban inhabitant? What, is there something that we can notice? Actually, uh, there is certain levels. So I'm a director of a hospital. So uh, first of all, we have to thinking about how a hospital is working in a society. Maybe we are the first hospital in Hungary who has the green footprint. How how it is working the, in the environmental field. But also there is a we are responsible for a patient that uh, can we teach them to something or can we show them something about how can they live and what is the common basis because first of all we have to see ourselves and then we can make good decisions about a greener future about a better future so this this is how a cardiologist thinking about we are focusing on patient on another level but first of all we have to give information about the patient how they can find themselves and then we can teach them on a common way if uh, I can add yeah, one, just one thing, because I wanted to reply what what Balaj said. You said that the cities are built as an old <coughs> structure, and but I just wanted to also think say that cities are made of people. So even if a city is, a, is old, people are changing and people are new, and I think they are also helping a little bit in restructuring the city mm. as well. And how how difficult is it? Do you think to mobilize people to uh, to change what the fabric of their city looks like? Well, it, it is difficult. I mean, uh, it, it should be my job <laughs> as a journalist also to inform people because there is, I think, a lot of lack of awareness uh, of people. Of, uh, I know, for example, there are a lot of surveys and, uh, and data about the trust of people in electric vehicles, for example. And a lot of people don't even think that it's easier to use, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, there are a lot of safety concerns of where the charging stations are located. So there is also this thing, people have to change, first of all, their mindset. Yeah. And uh, I see, I mean, also in, in, in Budapest, I think this thing is happening. I see a lot of people riding a bike, for example. Uh, I see a lot of transformations happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know a few years ago it was, it was tricky to sort of introduce the idea of, of electric cars. 
because then you're going against what people's emotions and feelings are. You know, that's not a real car. It doesn't go <clears throat> when I do that. Um, so, do you think that that's sort of lessened? Do you think people are sort of adapting a little bit? Balash, could you reflect on that? I think in Hungary, the first problem with the cars, with the transportation, was the cost because Hungarians have much, much less money than other Western European countries, and this is a problem here. The e-cars are much more expensive than, a, than an average car. So when it will change, I think we can, we can change the mind. Right, okay. That's the first thing. Um, I think on the other way, uh, we, can, uh, we can talk to people about e-transportation, um, and, and, and they are okay with that. The price, that's the, that's the most important thing in Hungary. Okay, um, well, can, do you think it's possible for us to, to sort of put the genie back in the bottle? Because clearly you're talking about how, how polluted cities are. I mean, all, all of you are. Do you think we've gone too far? Is there something we can do, or are we just sort of putting a Band-Aid on an axe wound? Of course, oh, of course we can. Of course, yeah. of, of course we can do things. That's why we are here. Um, we can do many, many things. People don't know, I'm, I'm, I am the founder of the Jön Alapítvány. It, it, we are operating the Waste Hunter application. Uh, we have more than 10,000 users. And, uh, and uh, we are operating since uh, 2016. And we are over 10,000 cubic meters of illegal waste. So, so uh, we can do something. This, this, this example shows that we are okay. We are okay with that. We, we we plan to rid the illegal waste in Hungary, and we are on a good way with that. I know there is m lots of uh, dumping at the moment as well, but we started it. We got the people's attention, so I think with 10,000 users, we are more than okay with that. How do you stop dumping in the first place? How do you, how do you stop the illegal dumping from happening? I'm. <laughs> We have frequented areas which are very polluted, and uh, we can we can build cameras. Right. That's that's a that's a good solution. Okay. And uh, of uh, and also uh, we we made many many cleanups on these areas. And I think you should that come in the south of Italy. <laughs> to uh -huh. do that as well. I, you should use our application. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so um, yeah, we found it out that. These areas, which are very polluted, um, the locals did not give any attention before. And when we started to do the cleanups, they saw that we are we are we are collecting their waste. So they are started to change their behavior, and they started to pick up yeah. the stuff. So so we cleaned many many areas. Seems like we have a gentleman over here who has a question. But I, I, do, I do have a question for, for both of you, Balaj and Emil. You're part of the Smokeless City campaign. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that, Emil? We, as, as doctors, started a harm reduction association here in Hungary because what we found that uh, the smoke-free alternatives could be a really helpful thing for a longer and better life. And in this moment in Hungary, we have exactly not too many ideas how it is working. And we have to show for our patients first and show for the society how it is works. And this is why uh, we are trying to, to act with anybody who, who has an idea how can give ad uh, advice for the society. Uh, we have medical ideas, but anything which can help for a society, a smoke-free alternative or, or, or a, a different way of life, uh, which is a healthier way, is good for us. This is why we, mm -hmm. uh, we are a part of this program. We are really, really wrong time in this business yeah. about the smokeless uh, campaigns and, and, and cigarettes and cigarette butts. So that's why we are in this campaign, because uh, we are dealing with this long, long time ago. And uh, there was no any, any organization, for example, with the cigarette butts to uh, get the attention of the locals, of yeah. the people. And, 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 and we did it. So, so we, we did many um, uh, events uh, with collecting cigarette butts on the streets. And these people started to spread the word 
So I, I, I think that was our first connection with these smokeless campaigns. And then we started to think about, okay, it's not, not it, the, the, the illegal waste is not the only problem. Mm -hmm. The smoke is the other problem, uh, what the cigarettes are causing. So we are started to focusing on the smoke as well. So that's why I am here now. Great. Uh, Claudia, what does that make you think of? I'm, I'm sure that you have some thoughts about the, the efficacy of, uh, of PMI getting involved in a smokeless city. C can you reflect on that a little bit? you're not the right person to ask <laughs> that. <laughs> because I'm a heavy smoker, so I'm so sorry. No, that, that's, that's all right. Uh, I actually liked when I, when I came to Hungary that you have these like, restricted smoking areas. Mm -hmm. For example, I remember when I arrived in Hungary the first time, the first thing that I did out of the airplane was, was lit up a cigarette. And, and immediately policemen harassed me and said, you have to smoke there, there is a square, and that's your designated area. Like okay, I'm, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that. And I think it's very nice that also in in, a, in Budapest and in other cities, you have you cannot smoke, for example, in front of the entrance of the shops or the restaurants. You have to be lo always like five meters away from uh, from these. So mm -hmm. I think this is already something that I haven't seen, for example, in my hometown at all. Yeah, I mean Italy is a pretty big yeah. smoking culture. I I, d I have I have doubts about um, s some of the some of the alternatives. So you know the the cigarettes are slowly being replaced with mm -hmm. the with, with the ICOS things, but that's a different form of of waste creation, isn't it? I mean, rather than a cigarette butt, you have the the ICOS cartridges, you have the single-use plastic in the in, in the wrapping of the cartridges, you have the plastic used in the in the heating element itself. Um, isn't that replacing this type of waste with a different type of waste? It is replacing. I'm 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 doing experiments with the with the heat butts, <laughs> and uh, and I know that this is recyclable, so I know the way how to do that. But practically, people have stopped tossing their cigarette butts on the street, and now they're just taking the heats. Um, I think uh, it feels like a a, a deeper solution heats, needs to be found. Heats are not burned butts. So it's a, it's a different story. You can you can put it back to the box. That's it. I know so many so many people are complaining about it. It is stinky, but you can find a way. It's, it's a, a, a normal cigarette, but it's much more stinkier than than the than the heat. To be honest, I prefer the smell of a cigarette butt to a heat. I mean, like it, a cigarette doesn't smell like burnt popcorn <laughs> inside a gym locker room. <laughs> What's so, wrong with burnt popcorn smell? <laughs> it ruins everyone's movie night. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, what's, what's the future of the of the smokeless city campaign? What are the new horizons you're looking at? So, what we have to see, uh, what I would like to see in the future, that um, first of all, the smokers are mainly nicotine dependent. The nicotine makes dependency. And uh, from a cardiologist point of view, we would like to see uh, the nicotine-dependent people with a, with a smoke-free alternative, so the, uh, the not burn alternatives, uh, because it makes us a longer life. This is one thing. The other one, uh, with the smoke, we are harm our neighbors. So in an uh, urban society like here, uh, we have to thinking about not only ourselves but about our neighbors. So that that can be the next step. I think for the uh, next year it, it could be enough. So if we will understand each other a little bit better, it's much much better than uh, the misunderstanding. Uh, and I, I hope so. In the next year we will be here and we will find some better solutions. For Excellent. The next I see we have a question over here. First is, uh, what will life in Budapest be like in 2013? Mm -hmm. And uh, second, uh, what other opinions do we have to make people interested in environmentalism uh, apart from giving higher payments? What, what does Budapest look like in 20, 2030? Yes. Eight years. It will be the same. Absolutely. <laughs> it will be the same. I hope... Uh, I don't know, the traffic will be much more easy. I, this is my hope, but it's only a hope. Yeah. Healthier people, much more understand each other, uh, know each other. 
and uh, understand the world around us and not focusing only about to Hungary or to Budapest. That Let me amend that question a little bit. Claudia, what would you like to see Budapest look like in 2030? Well, 2030, is, I think it's really close uh, to make like a significant change. So I, I also would agree with the others that it's the people that have to change. So maybe not a different town, but different people in it, because then we all lead by example. We all live by example, mm -hmm. basically. We all do what the others do, and that's the same thing, for example, for illegal dumping. If I see a person dumping something out there, then if it's already done, if it's already out there, why should I do that? So I, I hope that it's going to be the people change it in, uh, in 2030. Because, I mean, if we have to think about, yes, less cars, it means that we have to spend a lot of more money in the EV sector. If we want to have more parks, we also have to transform the city, right. and this also means money. And with the crisis that we have right now, I don't think that we will have enough money also to take care of that. So it's, it's, it's more of a mindset change yeah, as far as you're concerned. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Give it up for my guests, everyone. Thank you.